Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey, John. Hey, Jimmo. <laughs> that just sounds wrong. That's not right. Start this <laughs> over. You start it off. I'm going to start. I'm sorry. You hey go there, ahead. G- hey there, Jim. Hey, Jono. It's How all good you? now. Now yeah. we're back. Now it's the world is right again. I'm good. How are you doing? Now we're cooking with Gaspard, as we yes. used to say in high school. <laughs> uh, I'm great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're deep in the throes of season two, episode uh, 214. That means chapter 14 of the bullet catch. We are racing along on that one. You know, I try to keep you updated as to when we get emails and things from people. We got just the the, the sweetest email uh, this week from a uh, listener named Warwick Harvey, who is such a good listener that he actually sort of put recurring jokes that we do in to the body of his email. You're I'll kidding. It to I you know afterwards. we do recurring jokes. Uh, yeah, we do. There's stuff that comes up that uh, mostly you, not me. Anyway, uh, Warwick currently hails from Bilovec, which, as you know, is near Ostrava or Ostrava uh, in the Czech Republic. What? Yes. He one of the reasons he wrote was he thinks he is he, that he is now, uh, besides our friend in Switzerland, he might be the furthest listener. He is four thousand six hundred ninety nine miles from Minneapolis. Just a minute. I'm going to do the math here. Four, six, nine, nine. Carry the two. Carry the two. That's about 7,562 kilometers in case you were well, in case you were wondering about the metric conversion there. Yeah, you're pretty close on that. Um, I converted it to Celsius in my head. <laughs> now you're doing the West Wing. Okay, I crossed uh, that. In case you need to know what that conversion is, just double the number and add 30 and you'll be pretty close. Is that right? According to my wife, and it seemed to work every time when we were uh, traveling overseas. Just look Double at the number and add 30. Double and add 30. So when they say it's uh, 14 degrees Celsius, it's 28 plus 30. So it's 58. It's not that cold. If they say it is 30 degrees Celsius, it is 90 degrees. So I don't like that for nothing. Yeah. Anyway, so that's a little, you know, folks, you may want to turn off right now because that's as educational as this is going to get. <laughs> if anyway, you're looking, if you're looking for more math, there are other podcasts you may want to listen to because. Welcome to the program. It's nice to have you here. Thank you for listening all the way into the Czech Republic. As he pointed out, um, he's originally from Melbourne, Australia, and that's over 9,000, close to 9,500 miles from Minneapolis. So I'm throwing this out there. Just about any listener in Australia, you can grab the title of for this listener. It's it's yours for the taking. Wow. That's, uh, that's Isn't that cool? It, it's very cool. Very cool. You know, we spent a lot of time on this podcast talking to magicians who started out as amateur magicians and went on to become professional or full-time magicians. But occasionally, we like to talk to people who started out as magicians and then use that as a springboard to other careers. Like who? Oh, Jeff Altman. We talked to Jeff Altman, and that's what Jeff did. He went from magic to comedy and and comedy full-time, and now he's sort of back to magic. Yeah, and uh, an early guest, Dick Cavett, starting magic and then moved on to become, well, Dick Cavett, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Uh, Today we have another success story of someone who started into magic, moved into comedy and magic, moved into comedy, and has grown that into being a writer, an actor, producer, playwright, a podcaster. And the reason he got out of magic? Two words, Jerry Seinfeld. Today's guest is the charming, funny, and talented Pat Hazel. Now, I first heard about Pat I want to say approximately 1 million years ago. Oh, really? He had a touring show called The Wonder Bread Years. Uh, he, I think, was one of the first stand-ups to do a one-man kind of theatrical show. The version I saw was out at the Chanhassen Dinner Theater downstairs in the, I think they were there where they did I Do, I Do. Oh, and yeah. instead of Pat Hazel, uh, local actor David Mann, was doing the show. I think Pat at that point was trying to give different versions of the show around with different actors. He didn't have to do it every single time. Uh, and, and David did a great job. I have links in the show notes uh, to both Pat Hazel and David Mann doing a scene from the Wonder Bread years, which is just a, a very funny, sweet show. Oh, I'd like to see that. Now, I, I am aware of Pat because of Bunk Bed Brothers, which um, some other local actors were in. And, and one of those other local actors was uh, my dear friend, Michael Egan, was in uh, uh, Bunk Bed Brothers. So uh, I knew uh, of Pat from that. But boy, oh boy, uh, he's been around and has done some great stuff. Heck, he used to open for Jerry Seinfeld on the road 
Yeah, he opened for Seinfeld and he was uh, one of the original writers, I think, for the first season. He also was the uh, warm up guy for the audience for Seinfeld. That is so cool. Uh, And uh, Seinfeld said, essentially, your material is so strong. Get rid of the magic. You really don't you really don't need the magic. You're funny enough. And then he realized that, that Seinfeld may have said that because he was tired of waiting with Pat at the airport at baggage claim for all the check luggage full of his magic. <laughs> magic. Well, is that apocryphal or not? I don't know. But you I and either. I have both traveled in the corporate world and there is a certain disdain, a certain uh, uh, what um, Arlo Guthrie called the hairy eyeball given to people who have checked bags and not just brought their bags on because nobody wants to wait while you wait to get your bag. The first gift that Eugene Berger ever gave me was a copy of the book. The I, I think it's called The Packing Book. And it's about how to pack so you never, ever, ever have to check a bag. Then you can just get off the plane and go right to transportation. I need to get that to book. Said, you, you have to look at this book. What is this big bag you brought? You, you came in from Minneapolis to Chicago. What is, it's a steamer trunk. Who's in there? You need to look at this book. And so he went out when we were out, you know, running around. He said, hang on, I've got to run into this book for a second. He came back out here. Here's this book. Take this home and read it. And it here's the, the premise of this book. You could tour Europe with two pairs of underwear. You could be gone a month, two pairs of underwear. One you're wearing, one you have washed with soap in the sink at wherever you're staying and hung up to dry so you got clean underwear the next day. I said, um, I'm not going to finish the book because I know I'm never going to do that. I know I'm never going to do that. That's not who you are. No, it's not who I am. So I always check a bag and that's just the way it is. Because I know you, having traveled with you, that each day when you're done uh, with your underwear, it goes into a plastic bag. It is then FedExed home and you've bought new underwear and only new underwear touches your skin for the duration. That's right. I learned it from Jerry Lewis in the socks. (laughs) I'm sorry. Did you not know that about Jerry Lewis? I did not. He never, ever wore a pair of socks more than once. That's that's honest to God truth. (laughs) He went through seven pairs of socks a day, sometimes two a day, because once he no, wore them, no, no, seven pairs good. of socks a week. He wouldn't go through seven pairs of socks a day. What is well, he share? No, it's he's Jerry Lewis. What he, anyway, he, we're getting very, oh, very far right. afield here. Let me just okay. say that uh, Pat, besides working at Seinfeld, he's done other pilots. He's done other theatrical ventures, like you mentioned, Bunk Bed Buddies and uh, Wonder Bread Years. He still does stand up and one man shows. He has a terrific, and I mean terrific, far better than this podcast called Creativity and Captivity. Uh, and I would urge you to just hit pause and go listen to all of the episodes. It's a really fantastic podcast talking to people who uh, are creative and how they became creative and how they stay creative uh, with just a, a stellar lineup of, of guests, including Susan Stroman and our own friend, Jay Johnson. Wow. So that's great, except now I'm worried that Warwick in the Czech Republic is going to stop listening to us and start listening to Warwick. Don't leave us, please. You know what? Warwick, close circuit to Warwick. Stay with us, Warwick. You know what? What's the saying about if you love something, set it free. And if it doesn't come back, it was never yours to begin with. Oh, I didn't. I learned it this way. If you love something, set it free. If it doesn't come back, hunt it down and kill it. Different approach, not necessarily wrong. Anyway, while Pat Hazel may have had an eclectic career, uh, his beginnings as a magician were actually pretty darn typical. Let's just start right at the beginning. At what age did magic enter your life? Ooh, early. I think probably nine, 10 years old, I got a magic kick for Christmas. And uh, I don't recall if it was a TV magic kit at that time, but TV magic was a prevalent commercial with Marshall Brodeen and, you know, flipping cards to make them blank or stripper decks or any of those kinds of things that in the hands of a kid, you could find people's cards instantly. It, it sort of took the sleight of hand out of it, but it gave you instant response. And that I think in some of the enthusiasm of magic is getting a couple of those self-working tricks where somebody chases you around the house, trying, you know, with a little finger guillotine or something, they want to know how it works. And it's just so uh, terrific to have a secret when you're that age. Do you remember anything else that was in the kit? Oh boy, there were lots of things. I had, I had the luck of having an uncle 
who was one of these super fun guys who, when I opened the magic kit on Christmas, he took me in the other room and he's like, let's, let's see how this works. So I had some guidance and you know, the things I could do, he would show me the things that I couldn't. And, but then he literally went out to everybody and said, Hey, there's going to be a magic show in the living room at eight o'clock. Like I didn't even have any desire <laughs> to, to put on a show, but he sort of said, whatever tricks you can do by then we're going to do. And boy, there were, I, you know, the ball and base was in every kit at that time and in every cereal box. Uh, but he showed me some, some clever ways to hide the ball under the base of it and things that were kind of, I didn't come to discover till much later were sort of advanced for that, as opposed to just lifting the top and lowering the top kind of thing. So it was fun. Um, uh, the earliest tricks I remember was the one where the, and this was separate. This trick was something we bought at Myers news, which was the magic shop in Omaha, where it was primarily a newsstand magazines and, things like that. And there was a counter, a magic counter. And it was the tins that were held together with rubber bands. And inside of one little set of tins was another set of tins. And inside that there was a little basket or a little um, bag with a rubber band around it. And so you would vanish a quarter or a dime or something that had been marked and it appeared inside all of this nested material. And it was such a cool thing because no adult could figure out how you could possibly manage this as a kid to have somebody make a mark on a coin and it to end up at this impossible place was like a handshake with the devil. You know, <laughs> they, you just felt so good of them going, wait, what is it? How did that happen so fast? What could have possibly come about? And you, you know, it was the simplicity of what it was it, it, you know, you just, you would reset and you run to the next neighbor and do it. It was that kind of a trick. Uh, yeah, it, it's a great trick. Do you think that as you look back is, would that be like the first trick you mastered or was that still um, in the evolution? Well, I don't even know, know about mastering because that didn't really seem to take much effort. <laughs> I, I, I would say that I owe my success to the invisible card trick ah. because I did a lot of things. I learned a lot of things. I learned a little slight. I learned a floating ball. I learned something. But when I learned the invisible card trick and got it down and my dad was fooled by it and just, he, he really wanted to know what was going on. I said, I can't, you know, magicians never tell their secret. We can't, I can't reveal it. I have a code, you know, like I lived and died by the idea that now I have something that grownups can't believe that they, they would speculate. Um, for those that don't know the trick, essentially one card thought of in their mind is flipped over in the deck of cards. And it's been done by thousands of magicians all over the world. But listening as a kid to people go, you must have 52 decks of cards in your jacket. And like just hearing them get it wrong made you just feel so powerful. And you're like, oh, this is ridiculous. They're out of their minds. But, but at that time, it wasn't, you couldn't just Google the trick. And, and to me, that's, I would say, the hardest thing to be a part of at this point in life is that you you have no moment of wonder that sustained very long before somebody goes, well, I, I can go figure it out. You know, there's just sort of this kind of weird challenge against the idea of wanting to stay in the puzzle and figure it out. And I mean, if there's any other reason to hate the internet, that to me is one of them, <laughs> you know, how, how many things in life can you be in awe of and just take a bath in it? You know, it's sort of like if, if like when you walk up to the Grand Canyon and it's, you know, sun up or sundown and you look out, there's nothing like that moment of wonder. And you go, do people know about this place? You know, like this is insane. Uh, but you have to make a pilgrimage. You have to go to the trouble. You have to be there at the right time of day. You have to, you know, to, to have all of that infused. And then you can't capture it with just taking a picture and hope that that those moments of color and sunset. And it doesn't happen that way. It has to be live, it has to be in person. And I feel like this, this is what's, you know, everybody taking a selfie of themselves in front of the Grand Canyon. They're blocking it. You can see their forearm and there's something. And it's like, okay, you're there, but you're in the way of the wonder. But, <laughs> and I'm not a curmudgeon by any stretch of the imagination. I just feel like this cynicism has taken over, uh, you know, they don't, they don't want the, like, to me, 
every magic trick is an agreement that I'm going to try to fool you. You're going to try to enjoy it. And if you don't want that, and there are people who don't, there are people who get frustrated by it and whatever, it's kind of like, we'll go do another thing. Like, don't pick the card if you don't want to go on the journey. Right. You know, I, I love not knowing, I don't know if you know Dean Dill, Dean has passed some years ago, but I used to go get my hair cut at Dean's when I was in Glendale and he would challenge me with puzzles, with riddles, with boxes you had to open. And I would stay well after the haircut because I didn't want the answer. I wanted to solve the problem. Right. And to me, when you want to talk about a transferable skill that magic gives you, it's being a problem solver. Because you never in a magic trick say, this is impossible. You always think there's a way. So if, the, if, if this is the skill I take with me as a producer is that I don't take no for an answer. I don't say in any, in, in the riddle is this, we're going to float a lady. We're going to cut a person in half, we're, whatever. You don't go, that's impossible. You can't float somebody. You ask the question, what method do we want to use? Do we want to use hydraulics? Is it going to be inflatable underwear? Is it going to be strings? Is it going to be somebody under the stage? Whatever. You just begin to think about solutions. And I feel like everybody in our business that is successful, and this goes for writers as well as magicians, is that you are solving a series of problems. You're creating tension by creating a riddle that seems like, oh my God, this is impossible. And then you're finding a way to it. So when I compare your writing to being a magician, you're making something appear where there was nothing. You are it's an act of courage to face a blank page and to take a story and to take people on a journey where things become real. And it's the same idea. A magician in many ways is just a storyteller who creates a narrative which is, I'm going to lose a card and find a card. I'm going to cut a thing and put it back together. I'm going to, you know what I mean? There's, yep. there's an idea of what story does, which is it creates this tension for what the hero wants. And, and then how, do, how many obstacles do we get in their way? And that's exactly what you saw a person in half. That's an obstacle. <laughs> how do we get them back together? You know, it's, it's unsatisfactory in some ways if you make a person disappear or you cut somebody in half. And then you say good night, right? That's that's sort of like, oh, this. I th how many assistants has this guy killed in the last <laughs> twenty years? Um, I I read somewhere that you also uh, at a younger age were doing juggling as well, and I'm just wondering with juggling and magic, you're you know with juggling, you're trying to show them your skill and how hard you've worked, and with magic, you're trying to hide how hard you're working. What drove you uh, into juggling? Uh, I, I generally, and this is not that I wanted to be an accessible show off, but I really liked the skill-based stuff and particularly liked the top hat work. And I saw a juggler named Chris Cremo do multiple top hat things that he was doing several hats at a time onto his head and onto his foot and on the floor. And I was like, it was like, to me, the most amazing thing possible. So I spent time with that, but I was, <laughs> I wouldn't put myself at the top of the juggling heap. I eventually learned to, to juggle five balls, but I got much more out of dropping them and then saying, this is a, a quick impression of a horse. And it looked like, you know, road apples hitting the ground like that. That was better than my act. If, if it were the comedy relief was sort of the solution to it. Uh, but I learned the devil stick and I learned a little bit of the boxes and I learned, I learned a little bit of everything. And I will tell you to reveal my top secret way that I even wedged my way up the ladder was that I was the magician at the juggler's convention and I was the juggler at the magic convention and I was the comedian among the songwriters and I was the, you know what I mean? So I, it's, it's just a strategy I call being the squirrel at the zoo. You can go in the cages and eat the food and people can wait and then you can go out and go over the wall and do your thing outside. Like just being a little bit on the outside of industries that you could also be on the inside of. So most people don't know the various doors I went in and out of. But when I wrote in sitcoms, having a sense of humor was great. Um, it was it was a, an asset. So you have this toolkit. But while there, I had to learn to be a better writer. And so, you know, you, you sort of take a little bit of everything you can from each industry. And all of it to me amounted to being a producer. It, because that's what you're doing. You're, you have to, a magician is essentially a producer in a tuxedo. 
they have to solve every problem. They have to fix their props. They have to do it on time. They have to be, do the budget. They have to advertise their own act. They, you know, they, they don't know that this is what they're doing, but they have to do every detail of a thing. Their costume, they don't, they don't take it backstage to a costumer. They're like in the dressing room, just mending their sock and fixing the broken glass or whatever. You know, the, the crusty rubber bands that hold your TV card frame together are gone and now it's showtime. So you're like looking for a hair ribbon, whatever you can do, you're, you're much more a producer than you are, you know, a, um, I don't know, the whole idea of the classy leisure domain persona of a person who comes out in control minutes before they're stuffing a dove in a sock and putting it down their pants, you know, like, you know, I don't want to expose them, but I've, I've been many a magician who I like where you can't pat them on the back or give them a hug before the show. You'll kill something. <laughs> you know? Okay. So let's just talk about humor for a second, because I'm laughing at just about everything you say. Uh, were you always sort of naturally funny? Did you acquire it? Did, was it a conscious, hey, I got to add humor to what I'm doing? Or where, where's the, was your dad funny, your uncle funny? Where does it come from? Right. I, I did have a family with a sense of humor and they weren't professional. They were just quirky and they did, they were not writers and they were not meaning to be funny. But there's just something naturally when you grow up around a a family of quirky people where that storytelling, I think, develops in a natural way. I also developed it as an insurance policy, as a as a defense mechanism. So I was a nerdy kid. Uh, magic was fun. It didn't make me lots of friends, but it did include once you're in junior high and high school, it, it was a reason for people to interact with you. And so uh, the tricks were fine, but if the tricks didn't go well, which frequently happened, the humor was the way out. The humor was the, well, I don't know if that was supposed to work or not work. I don't know. And I was always drawn to things that didn't look like magic tricks. So when I was doing the, a trick with the coins over the head, that was kind of a version of Slidini's paper balls. Everything I had got bigger until I had a trash can lid with a, uh, you know, George Washington painted on it and stuff looked like a giant quarter. But, but I love the common man look of those props. Like when I street performed because people wouldn't take it seriously. And, and, and then I began to see that if there was a currency for me, it was that humor was the sort of way of leveling everybody out. You break the ice with it. It's like a sugar pill. They can take the messaging if it's got some funny in it. And so always in writing plays, in writing screenplays, I, I don't think I'm doing it to dodge being serious in life. I just find it makes it all, every, it raises everything up a level. The moment of laughter for an audience is a communal agreement that we're alike. That's the human condition. The, the, the humanity of laughter is what we're missing in politics and in religion and so forth, because that I want to call that more of a binary thing that's like sports, where you root for your team, I root for my team, and somebody's got to lose and somebody's got to win at the end of the game. But in theater and in comedy, if you do it right, everyone's rooting for the same thing, right? The outcome is where we're all uplifted or happy or, you know, that, and that's what you get at a Broadway show or a Vegas magic show is you leave with this sort of euphoric idea. That I don't know what, how did that happen? Where did it come from? How did they do it? And it creates dialogue between you as opposed to, I hate that thing. <laughs> you know, those people stink, right? That's, and, and look, I don't know what's to fault for it, but we've moved into this, a dystopic uh, amount of of movies and television and even the structure of a show America's Got Talent or The Voice there has to be a lot of losers to have one winner and then we have to critique them and then we have to have judges saying you know I don't know about you right so somewhere along the way we were just slowly dismantling our respect for each other's talent and it becoming the kind of thing where in order for Tanya Harding to beat Nancy Kerrigan, she got to take a, you know, a hit to the leg. It's not like who's the better ice dancer. It's like, how do I get my competition out of the way? So I feel like that's kind of maybe <laughs> a little preachy, but you know, we, we go to magic conventions and we watch all these people. And instead of saying, wow, that was some amazing stuff today. We go, I didn't like number three or five or that idiot, whatever. <laughs> and look, everybody's at a different level. They're trying their best. 
I mean, I think, I think we need to kind of get back into that cheerleading for better, for better results in the game. What was your act like uh, back in Nebraska? Did you make money from it? Did you do gigs? What was that going What was going you know, on there? I, I made my living as a comedy magician for a very long time. And I did it in different ways. I, I did close up table to table restaurant magic for a long time at places like the spaghetti works. And I, uh, you know, I, I artfully used my marketing and leverage brain that when I had one restaurant and was on a roll on Thursday nights, I went to a different restaurant to use that as an example, but I upped the price when I went to the next place. And then I, over time, I would go back to the first one and say, Hey, they'll take me two nights a week, unless you want to up the price a little, you know, I just sort of, but I got a lot of practice hours in and a lot of tips in. I would do street performing out on the street on the weekends, because that was a place of pure audacity to make money and street performing. You sell the ticket after the show. It has to be good. Otherwise, they walk away at any point, right? So you're always trying to figure out the pitch and figure out what to do. So I did that. I did corporate parties. I did all kinds of things. Um, and, and I made my living from doing comedy magic. I would say the, the bulk of my college days and, and after that. Um, but it was sometime when I made the move from Nebraska to Los Angeles, where I thought to myself, okay, this is the time that I have to define myself while they don't know who I am. So I wanted to be a stand-up comedian and I wanted to be a monologist and I wanted to be on the tonight show. And so that was, but I still had an affection. I went to the magic castle. I had lots of friends that were magicians. I see your list of people and I go, I know all those people, you know, that you talk to John Carney and you talk to Mike Caveney. And th these yeah. are people that I have great respect for their cleverness, their sense of humor and all that kind of thing. And so magic has always been a part of my life. It's just that I've now converted my magical thinking into theater. So I have in the bunk bed brothers, I have a set of floating bunk beds where the top bunk blasts off and whatever, but people don't look at it as a levitation. They look at it as a fantasy sequence where one brother wants to be an astronaut and his bed blasts off. And so they don't, they don't behave the same way. They don't want to figure it out. It's more like a, a cat's ending on a little comedy play when, when this thing blasts off, but it's magic. Can we can we talk about the Carson show for a minute? Because you know who uh, who wouldn't want to have had that uh, experience being on the Johnny Carson Tonight Show? Good Lord! Uh, just walk us through that. W what did you get a chance to talk with them? He's you know a big magic guy. Did tell yeah. us about it. Well, that was the top of the pyramid to be on Johnny's show, right? The as a comedian, as a magician, anything you, when you got the okay symbol from him out the side, you knew that you were, your career was launched, you know, because it's not just as seen on TV, it's as seen on the Johnny Carson show, which was then a marketable, a tonight show comedian could play comedy clubs, could play uh, conventions, could play anything. It was some, it was a seal of approval. Right. And I did my first one with Johnny, like, I want to say 1989. It was just days before my 10 year high school reunion. I had no bragging rights of any kind. And then I did the tonight show with Johnny Carson, who was a fellow Nebraskan. And so they put it on the, the news, you know, hometown boy does good. And so now I came by, I walked into the reunion, like, you know, like the King of Siam, you know, I just, Everybody was like, oh, you know, I was like, yeah, well, I was sleeping on somebody's couch two weeks ago, but you know, this is, but you know, I'm a big success. The, the greatest thing that I had with Johnny and, and it was, it felt very uh, personal and avuncular was that he found out I was coming to be, to, to do stand up. He had heard that I was good at sleight of hand. So the word got out that I was good with a deck of cards. And so while I was in my dressing room, I got called to his office and I, I assumed Everybody gets this call that he wants to make you feel at home, whatever. And so we're in there and I'm doing some card tricks. I did this trick where I bounced the card off the desk and it stuck in the deck and he lifted it up and his card was right there. And I was pretty proud of it because I had worked a lot on that sort of the juggling aspect of it and so forth. And he, uh, he then said, Oh, I got a thing I want you to take a look at. And he did the hanging coins, which is a really hard piece of manipulation where you're, you're, you have a handful of half dollars that you're, making appear all at the tips of your fingers. And I couldn't believe how good he was at it. 
And I was, he said, oh, I, st- I keep, I practice the drums and I practice this magic stuff all the time. And, and then someone's banging on the doors like 40 minutes later, Hey John, we got a show to do. And I, it was so cool to just spend time with this guy talking about magic and showing him card tricks. And, and then that made me feel very at ease to do the stand up and, and, and then I told my, some of my comedy friends about that. And they're like, wait a minute, you went to his office. You talked to him before I go. Yeah. Didn't you do that? And they go, no, no, nobody does that. Like, that's not a thing. I go, Oh, I thought that was the thing. Like I, I thought it was like, he doesn't want me to, you know, be uneasy. So he's just, I, anyway, it was an amazing, very brief 40, 45 minute encounter that really gave me a sense of self-confidence continuing in my career that, that I had Johnny's, you know, okay. I, I, I look back at it and, and realize it was, you know, a, a complete anomaly to what other people had had experience wise, but, you know, I left there just feeling fantastic. I feel fantastic just hearing the story. That's just, uh, it's just awesome. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were awkward parts about doing the, the stand up all your life. You're conditioned. You're working at a microphone with a stand. You're doing that. And you walk out there and they've got an overhead boom mic. And yeah. you, you know, you just, it's like you're cut loose from a spaceship and the tether's been snapped and you don't know where to like, you're like, ah, and then you go, wait, normally my hands are doing something. And so now you're brushing your tie and putting your hands in your pocket. You just, it's like you're flailing around at the same time as you're trying to do the most important monologue of your life. <laughs> uh, and it's sweet. I mean, to watch comics debuts on these shows, it's just, there's a funny energy and awkwardness that is, you know, that somehow you muscle through it and you survive. It's like cliff diving. If you don't die on that one, you'll do it again. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, it really is. You mentioned earlier, that uh, you learned some key things about producing by being a magician, because a magician is his or her own producer, or the better magicians are. Is there anything else you took away from uh, all your magic experiences that has helped you produce? Yeah, I think there's many things. Number one, as a writer and as a producer, I'm creating an experience for the audience. Knowing where to make them look is very important. It's not just misdirection, it's actual direction. You want them to see this part of the story. You want them to pay attention to this. You have a piece of scenery coming on here. Like there's a whole mechanics to staging your event so it flows, so the story keeps telling. That is absolutely magical thinking. So how do you keep everything happening so that it's not all episodic and, you know, that lights go black and they roll a piece of scenery on and whatever. You have to kind of maintain that storytelling in those moments. I also think the, you know, the emotional ride that people are on, you want, you want it to uh, be kind of, you, you want this stuff to level up so that if there's a mystery and there's a next obstacle and where did the thing go? And, you know, that's what, when we saw any magician, Siegfried and Roy, Copperfield, whatever, where the person appears in an impossible place and you go, okay, well, I understand if it was two assistants, maybe one's a twin, but there's no two David Copperfields. Like this dude's coming out of the back of the crowd. What is happening here, right? And that is, again, masterful storytelling because you don't remember how much time happened since you saw the guy and when he appears because there's so much going on. That's all logistics. If you talk to Chris Kenner, who's David Copperfield's producers, he doesn't think of himself as a creative person. He's just a problem solver. He just has to figure out how to do this faster, cleaner, better, cheaper, whatever, whatever the rules are, he's probably solving problems all day long. And, and he's one of the great producers there is in magic, but he also is dealing with the same problems logistically. If they're touring Russia, how does he get the stuff there? What's on the manifest? How do we keep them from destroying our props and they arrive on time? All of that goes on behind the magic show which is a different magic show yeah Uh, yeah, uh, do you uh, still kind of practice i I understand what you're saying in terms of how you approach life but do you still do an occasional card trick or a coin trick for people or Uh, i do and uh and occasional is probably a pretty good word when necessary (laughs) 
when the when it calls for i don't whip it out i don't a, after every dinner party where i don't need to i don't have the need to vanish the salt shaker that i did when i was a teenager but i i i, I surprise people because i think that there are many parts of my life they don't know that i have a magic background per se they don't know that that i can do this thing and i wouldn't say i can do the same kinds of things that i used to be able to do but i can do several things well I, i'm a good balancer of things which is a juggling trick but when you balance a dollar bill on your nose on edge or a pencil or something it's a pretty weird thing for people to see at a bar from a guy they've known for 15 years that they've never seen do it. So they're like, wait a minute. And, and the thing is, I just did it so much back in the day that there's muscle memory to it. But there's also stuff that I get invited to a magic convention and I say to them, you, you know, I, I have no, I can't fool anybody. I can't, this is not for magicians. This is for, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> people who have been in an iron lung that haven't seen anybody else do a card trick. You know, that's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm good for that one-off thing. You know, if you, I can maybe fool your kid, but I can't fool your dog. Like they're going to know which hand the dog treats in. You know, I count myself as being in that same camp. I might be able to fool a kid, but I don't. Dogs are very hard to fool. Dogs are yeah. harder to fool than monkeys. In Is case you're true? wondering. Yeah. And, and if that doesn't that sound like an odd non sequitur? Dogs are harder to fool than monkeys. Anyway, what fun it was to listen to Pat Hazel, and I could do that for several more hours. Uh, Absolutely. I'll tell you what, the price of admission for me was the story about getting the call to go to Carson's office. Yeah. Uh, and sit with Johnny Carson for the yeah. love of Pete. You're in Johnny Carson's office trading magic tricks with the man. And you're thinking this happens with every magician who comes on the show, but of course it doesn't. And then the timing, his perfect timing of right before his high school reunion, nothing has happened. He gets on Carson and can go back to his high school reunion and go, oh yeah, I was on Carson. Yeah, that's good karma there, right there. I don't know what uh, what kind of life he's living, but that kind of karma you can't buy. That, no, uh, you can't. That's a gift from the karma gods right and, there. And then... You know, on a more practical level, the idea that magicians are producers, they are problem solvers, the amount of things that they have to do for themselves that in any other theatrical situation, they'd have a whole team of people doing just it's, it's something that magicians probably don't realize that, uh, that they're doing all the work and, and uh, other people who walk on stage don't have to do half the stuff that they do to get ready. That's exactly right. There's uh, any time that we have worked with a magician in the corporate setting, I always marvel at the fact that uh, when I'm done, I just walk away and they got another two hours of putting things in boxes and clocking it up and taking it down to the uh, concierge to make sure it gets shipped to where it's going next. Uh, they, they are, they're hard workers, those magicians. They really they are. are. And it's reminded me of a very funny Pat Oswald story, which I will not recount here, but I will put a link in the show notes. He describes an uh, instance early in his career where he was opening for a magician. And just before they went on, the, uh, the person who was running the bar cut their salary each by $5. So instead of getting $25, I believe Patton is getting 20 Instead of getting 75 the magician is getting 70 And he, his response, the magician's response to being treated that way is very, he, he, what he does in his act. Anyway, I'll put a link in the show notes. And yeah, I hope no, that he, no, I'm I curious. Hope, because I will, yeah, yeah, I've and, never heard that. So yeah, it's a very funny because he, he takes it out on the audience, which he shouldn't have. Uh, and the only one who finds what he's doing funny is the, as I think Patton says, the little man in the back of the room who's cackling because of how this magician is reacting. Anyway, the purpose of the show is for people to listen to uh, chapters from uh, the Eli Marks books. Yeah, so that. Yeah. So let's, let's jump into that. We've got chapter 14. Yep. Can you bring us up to date, maybe? I will. I'll happily do that. In chapter 13, Eli had a nice visit with his uh, therapist, Dr. Baki. He had a creepy meeting with uh, Mr. Lime in his car. Uh, they uh, uh, dealt with the issue of dry hands, and he did uh, Dr. Daly's last card trick, which now brings us right up to chapter 14. <laughs> The Bullet Catch, an Eli Marks mystery. Chapter 14. 
I sat in my car for a while after the sedan had driven off. It had been an eventful day, and I felt the need to process all that had happened. I noticed my phone sitting on the passenger seat and turned it on, discovering it had been quite active while I was sharing my feelings with Dr. Baki and being vaguely terrorized by Mr. Lime. The first message was from Deirdre, asking if I'd made it home okay after our adventure in the parking ramp. Her voice was free of any sarcasm, and she actually sounded concerned and almost warm. I listened to the message twice, just to make sure it was really her. This was followed by a message from Harry asking me to call him. The phone registered three calls from him, all coming from the store, but he had only left one message. I tried the store and then his cell and got no answer from either. The third message was from Jake. It was short and to the point. Eli, call me when you can. Things have gone from bad to weird out here. Finally, the phone had logged a call from Trish, but she had left no message. I looked at her number for a long time, wondering not only what she might want, but why I was so drawn to helping her. Before I allowed myself to dig too deeply into my motivations, I hit the return call button, and after three rings, she picked up. Once again, she sounded like I had interrupted a crying jag. Oh, Eli, hello. Hi, I saw that you had called, I said. Yes, I was upset, I'm sorry. No reason to be sorry. What's going on? The police just talked to me about the death of someone Dylan knew. They said you knew him too. They asked me some more questions about the night Dylan died, and I'm really starting to think they suspect me of killing him or something. Oh, I'm sure that's not the case, I said, not even coming close to convincing myself. Would it help if we got together and talk, I suggested, again resisting the urge to plumb my motivations too deeply. Sure, she was in pain, and sure, she could use a friend, but she was also my high school crush, and she was still attractive, and now a widow. Before I could compare myself too closely to Jake, she answered, Oh, Eli, that would be very nice, if you don't mind, and I'm not interrupting something. Her voice trailed off, and I could hear her sniffling quietly on the phone. Not a problem. I'm not doing anything right now. If you want to grab a coffee or something, I suggested. Coffee at this time of day will keep me up all night, she said with a sigh, and I'm already having enough trouble sleeping. But there's a coffee shop down the street from here that has a nice selection of teas. And where's here? Oh, of course, she said with a short and unconvincing laugh. I'm volunteering at St. Paul House down on Washington Avenue on the north side of downtown, she said. I had never been there, but had seen their building for years as I'd driven by on the freeway, chuckling to myself that St. Paul House had chosen for some odd reason to locate in Minneapolis. At mealtimes, there was often a line around the block, even in what would be considered prosperous times. I know where it is, I said. My shift ends in about 40 minutes. There's a caribou coffee down the block. Rush hour was just starting, so it was 30 minutes later when I finally made it to the area, and then I spent five more minutes looking for a parking spot. I finally located one across the street from St. Paul House, which wasn't really a house, but instead a large brick warehouse space that had been converted over the years into a combination soup kitchen, food shelf, and homeless shelter. My timing couldn't have been better as I spotted Trish coming out the front door. I locked my car and waited for traffic to clear in order to cross the street. She saw me and waved, then turned to say hello to a group of three men who were just entering the facility. As a kid, I would have called them bums or hobos, but times have changed, and I recognized them for what they were, guys who had slipped between the cracks of society and were doing what they had to in order to get by. It was warm today, but I was guessing in the dead of winter, a place like St. Paul House was the only thing standing between them and freezing to death down by the river. I didn't know you worked here, I said, as I finally negotiated the traffic and made it across the street. Well, I'm not on staff or anything, she said. I volunteer here two or three days a week. Keeps me from going stir-crazy in the apartment. Dylan doesn't... She caught herself and restarted the sentence. 
Dylan didn't like the idea of me working because it got in the way if we wanted to take off for someplace exotic on a moment's notice. Not that we ever did, she shrugged. I guess it's going to take me a while to start getting the tents right. Come on, she said, forcing a smile. I'll buy you that cup of coffee. My coffee ended up being an iced coffee, as drinking hot liquids on hot days just seems odd to me. Trish was true to her word and went with a simple Earl Grey tea along with a slice of marble pound cake. In order to be sociable, I ordered a piece as well. At least, that was what I told myself. Once we settled into a table in the corner, there were some awkward moments as neither of us was sure where to start. So I picked up where we had left off. Volunteering at St. Paul House, I said. Good for you. It's oddly comforting to have this predictable schedule right now, she said. I mean, to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. I nodded in understanding. How'd you get started here? Well, my background is in nonprofits, so when in doubt, I always return to this world. Is that what you did after college? Our discussion at the reunion had been so focused on tripping down memory lane, I hadn't thought to ask about her career path. Oh, I did a million things after college, she said, trying to find myself. Pretty typical, right? I shrugged. You're talking to a guy who's still using jokes in his act he wrote when he was 15. Well, obviously, you found yourself at an earlier age. I'm not so sure. We sent out a search party once, but they came back empty-handed. She gave this a laugh that we in the business call polite. Anyway, for my first real post-college job, I ended up working at a nonprofit. I didn't care for the cause, but I liked the work and felt I was pretty good at it. What was the cause? She lowered her head in mock shame. I was assistant communications director for the Dried Fruit Council. And their mission? She sat up straight in her chair and recited it from memory. To promote the nutritional value and health benefits of dried fruit to the American people. That's a pretty compelling mission, I said. It should be. It took a year and a half and about $200,000 in consulting fees to come up with it. She shook her head. But that wasn't why I left. Ask me why I left. Why did you leave? It was fun to see her lightening up, if only a little. Because I was asked to write the copy for a save the date card for a big fundraising event. And you know the name of that event? I shook my head, sensing a punchline. It was called Save the Date. She took a sip of tea and added, You cannot make these things up. I smiled as I used the stir stick to move the ice cubes in my coffee. Not to bring us down, but you had a visit from the police? Her smile disappeared and she nodded. They said someone from the reunion killed himself and he knew Dylan, Howard Washburn. Did you know him? I shook my head. No, although he certainly seemed to think I knew him. He's in the yearbook, but I have no memory of him. That's what I told them. Dylan knew a lot of people I didn't know. She broke off a small piece of the pound cake and chewed it slowly. All kinds of people I didn't know, and that I'm glad I didn't know. So they came and talked to you about Howard Washburn. She nodded. This afternoon, they wanted to know my relationship with him, Dylan's relationship with him. They asked me where I was around the time he shot himself. And of course, it was when I was on my lunch break. So in their minds, I don't have an alibi. Just like when Dylan was killed. I'm sound asleep in our apartment, but in their eyes, I have no alibi. She brushed some crumbs off the tabletop. It's like they really think I'm involved in this in some way. And the insurance money certainly doesn't help. Insurance money? She seemed surprised. The police didn't mention that to you? I shook my head. A couple of months ago, Dylan took out a life insurance policy for a million dollars. Didn't tell me a thing about it, which was typical of him and his approach to our finances. And then he dies, and all of a sudden... It's suspicious. He bought the policy and named me as the beneficiary. Well, I said, trying to not look too surprised at this revelation. A million dollars is a lot of money, even today. She shook her head. It's not a million. 
it's two million because of the double indemnity clause. Apparently, a mugging is considered an accidental death. The words double indemnity triggered a thought, and I suddenly remembered the two names Mr. Lime had mentioned in the car. He had referred to Trish as Phyllis Dietrichson and warned me not to become Walter Neff, and I remembered that they were the two characters played by Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray in the movie Double Indemnity, a movie about a woman who murders her husband for the insurance with the help of a sleazy insurance salesman. My memory of the film was sketchy, but I was pretty sure Walter Neff wound up dead at the end, a fate I very much wanted to avoid. What's wrong? Clearly, my face was registering a look that warranted the question. Do you remember that old movie called Double Indemnity starring Fred McMurray? Mr. Douglas from My Three Sons? Yeah, that's the actor, but he was not a very nice or very smart guy in Double Indemnity. It was a similar situation, a woman, insurance policy. My voice trailed off, and I decided to shift the conversation back to the matter at hand. Do you know who Dylan bought the policy from? I would guess it was from the same guy we got all our insurance from, Roger Edison. You know Roger? He went to high school with us. I remember him well. He was at the reunion. He was? I don't remember seeing him there. But I would guess he sold the policy. That's what I told the police. Okay, I said, sitting back in my chair. So how did the police leave it with you? Are you a person of interest? I don't know what I am, she sighed. It's been a rough week. I'm crying a little less, but feeling guilty about it more. She finished her tea, crumpled her paper napkin, and placed it in the empty paper cup. But enough about all that. I'm so tired about all that. How are you doing, you know, with your thing? It took me a moment to realize what she meant by my thing, my mind sifting through several alluring options before realizing she was referring to my panic attacks. All the same, I said. I just came from therapy. I had a serious attack this morning at the top of a parking ramp with, of all people, my ex-wife. And let me tell you, there's nothing better for your ego than looking like a scared, simpering idiot in front of your ex-wife. Oh, I'm sure she didn't think that. I thought back to Deirdre's behavior and smiled in spite of myself. Actually, she was remarkably warm-hearted and caring about the whole incident. She must be mellowing with age. Was your divorce painful? More for me than her, I think. She wisely had a spare husband in the wings, so she made the transition from married to not married to married again fairly quickly. She was always good at planning things. Trish stared down at her empty cup, pushing it around the tabletop in a small circle. I was going to ask Dylan for a divorce soon. At least, that was the plan, I think. She looked up at me, her eyes starting to water. Was he aware of that plan? Who knows? I never really knew what was going on with him, which I guess was our biggest problem. He had too many secrets, and I didn't have any. She stared up at the ceiling for a long moment, then looked at me. I held her gaze. Why can't life ever be simple, she finally said. Well, according to my Uncle Harry, life is only simple for simple people. Your uncle sounds like a delightful man. Trish, you have no idea. <laughs> Oh, Uncle Harry, the way Eli and Uncle Harry, I just love the two of them. Uncle um, Harry's maybe my favorite character. Is that wrong? I like Eli too, don't get me wrong, but uh, there's something about Uncle Harry's uh, pithiness that I enjoy. Yes, his, his uh, take on the world is unique and always charming and no, he will never die. Uncle Harry will live forever. All right, so our next two episodes are going to be kind of special. We have a two-part interview with the one, the only, Nicholas Meyer, uh, director Ooh. of The Wrath of Khan, God! as well as the director and writer of the best Jack the Ripper movie, Time After Time. Ooh, that is a great, if, you know what, uh, if you're in the Czech Republic and you have not seen Time After Time, you got to track that down, because that thing is really a great movie, and I'll tell you, 
David Warner. Yeah, we talk about David Warner in our interview with uh, Nick in Meyer. I, I, to this day, can't see him in something and not go, don't turn your back on him. Don't turn your back on him. He's Jack the Ripper. I, I believe in the interview, you mentioned that to Mr. Meyer and said you couldn't even watch him in A Christmas Carol. I know. Tiny Tim's dad is Jack the Ripper. And you'll also find out in that interview that the studio was really pushing hard for Mick Jagger for that role. We'll find out what happened there. Anyway, in part one, uh, in our next episode, Mr. Meyer is going to talk to us about the miniseries he wrote based on his father's psychological study of Harry Houdini. A Mind in Chains. And it's a good book. And it, uh, it, the, the miniseries is terrific with uh, Adrian Brody. Something else, if you're in the Czech Republic, you might want to find and enjoy. Uh, then it, what's in part two, though? Part two, uh, we're going to talk about Sherlock Holmes. All oh, right, of course. Yes. Because uh, he's written some of the best, I would say, pastiches of Sherlock Holmes. And then it wasn't on the agenda. We were kind of asked not to go there, but we did stray into the Star Trek universe. That's exactly right. It uh, he, he checked so many boxes for me that I'm surprised I'm not still talking to the man. Magic, Houdini, Sherlock Holmes, Star Trek. I could have talked the rest of the week with the guy. He's fascinating and fun and um, thrilled that he's on our podcast and not Pat Hazlitt's. Yes. Oh, well, not yet on Pat Hazel's, but yeah, how do I know? Maybe he was. By the time we get this out, who knows? <laughs> not that Pat is trying to scoop us. I would never, I would never say that. Anyway, so that's a, a nice two episode arc that's starting uh, next episode, episode 215 and 216. That's good that you can do the math that quickly. What I did immediately was to uh, double it and add 30. So I was way off, way, way off. Uh, but listen, hey, you want to check some bonus videos that we've got on the Behind the Page YouTube channel and also in the show notes. So we've got some stuff of Pat Hazel doing uh, magic. There's clips from his one-man show, I think, as John mentioned, both him doing it and a great actor here in the Twin Cities named David Mann. Um, and... Did you put a link to the podcast? I did. There's a link in there to the uh, his Creativity and Captivity podcast. Now we're so, going to rue the day. Rue the day. That's what I say. Yeah, it'd be fun if we look at our stats and it's like we go from whatever number we are to zero. And then whatever that number was, <laughs> his podcast jumps up by, by the app. Anyway, while you're surfing around uh, the net and you're checking out the show notes, if you have time, take a moment, uh, rate and review us. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you don't have time. That's fine. Go live your life. It's okay. Yeah, we're not uh, some sort of slave drivers insisting. No. That you, but it would no. be great if you could. If you can and, and you got a minute and you're enjoying the show, uh, give us a rating. And uh, you know what else? Subscribe. I would subscribe. Yeah. We're we're heading like a train toward the end of season two. We have some fun ideas planned for season three. Yes, there will be a season three, Virginia. Oh, yes, there thank will. Goodness. Thank goodness. It'll look a little bit different because it'll be a haiku <laughs> and not a podcast, but no, it'll you'll be definitely involved in that uh, as you are occasionally involved in the occasional film podcast. Yes, if you have a chance, check out my other podcast, the occasional film podcast, which you can find wherever you find podcasts. Anyway, enough of the enough of this yimmer yammer, enough of uh, enough of me flapping our gums, enough yeah. of this shimmy shammy. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you uh, next episode and the one after that uh, for our two part interview with the great Nicholas Meyer. Bye bye. Goodbye, Warwick. Thanks for listening. I'm going to go right to his head. Right to his head. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham. Produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S mysteries.com. And thanks for listening.